they changed it from just record to record to the cloud, so I didn't see it there. Okay, so let's um do a quick review of what we had here. So we have stacks. This was last week. Uh, what is LIFO? Somebody know? Ever remember what that acronym? Yeah. Last in, first out. Last in, first out, which is also the way, by the way, that hiring works. Last person who got hired is the first person to get fired. There, there's a cheerful thought uh, to start the morning with. And so we have this stack here. We represented where we have the bottom of the stack and the top. And we have a choice. We could have the top at the last index, or we could have the top at the first index over here. So the question is, do you remember which one we decided to choose and why? When we did when we implemented it? Or when the book implemented it? Yeah. Top of the last index and the reason being? The ad method is what? That's right. We, we were using an array list and array list add and remove at the end, specifically how efficient it is. Namely, if we have the top at the last index, then both the removal and addition are order one. But if we put the top at the first index, then we have order n. Now, the person who's using the stack doesn't care how we did it. That's part of the abstraction. But we care because we would like this to be as efficient as possible. So that's why we put the top at the last index. And now the next thing we're going to be looking at um, today is a Q, or a FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. And think of it when you go to a restaurant and you're standing in line. Okay, you have an entry point. People go into the line at an entry point and they leave at an exit point. So if I were to add something to this Q, it would go and at the entry point, and now I've got two people standing in line. And then when the restaurant has a place available, they exit and they go into, they, they can exit the line and go into the restaurant. Okay, this is something we see all the time. And now I'm just making it more formal and saying, oh yeah, we we see it, we're experiencing it, but let's, let's be specific about it. And then here um, we have this. So if I were to get people leaving the line, there would be 64 would go out first, then 82, then 17, and then 59. So the first person that entered, the 64, is going to be the first one to exit. And so the question is, do we call them entry and exit? And the answer is no. The entry point is usually called either the tail of the queue or the rear of the queue or the back. And the exit point is usually called either the head or the front. And you'll see the mix and match for all of these. Sometimes you'll see front and rear, front and back. But when Java has a, remember the collections framework, they have a, something called a queue already and they use head and tail. So that's what I'm gonna use. Not my prefer, preference, but well, let's go with what Java says. So things go in at the, tail of the queue and they exit at the head. And here are the operations that we want to be able to do on our queue. And boy, these are just, first of all, they're hard to spell and they're hard to type, but again, we're stuck with this terminology. So when I want to enqueue something, that means I'm going to add something and I have to tell what item it is. It'll add an item and this will modify the queue. DQ will remove the item at the head and return it, which also modifies the queue. Uh, sometimes I want to see what's at the head of the queue, but don't modify it. I just want to look at it without removing it. Just the same way we had that on a stack. I wanted to see what was on the top of the stack without removing it. It's a useful operation. We also want to find out if a queue is empty. And we want to find the number of items in the queue. So these are basic queue operations. And the question is, how efficient are these? Well, first of all, the question is, how are we going to represent it? 
And we're going to represent the tail of the queue as the first item in the array list. And the last item in the array list is going to be the head of the queue. Okay, this is just a unilateral decision that we've made. And now, the, with a stack, we had order of one because we were only operating on one side of it. Now that we're operating on both ends of the array list, we don't have a choice. One of them is going to be order one. One of them is going to be order n. And even if we were to reverse the order, then we just reverse which one's order one and which one's order n. So we, we can't win on this one, unfortunately. The reason I'm uh, deciding to, and the book also decides to put the head at the end is because then the code is more consistent between stack and queue. So in this case, to enqueue an item, if I wanna add something else here at the first entry point, then everybody has to be pushed over to the right. Dequeuing is order one, and then peak, emptiness, and size are all order one operations. Is everybody clear on why that is? Yes? Oh, and that's all I had to say about that. So let's look at the actual code for implementing a queue. Uh, is this font size large enough or do you need it larger? Everybody care for that font size? Okay, it looks small to me. I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe my eyes are getting old or something. Yep. It's nice to put documentation in here so that whoever is reading this next is going to be able to figure out, oh, that yeah, that's what's going on. So we're gonna have the tail of the queue at the beginning, the head is the last item. To create a new one, we'll just create a new array list of, again, this is gonna be generic. That way we can have queues of integers, queues of strings, queues of whatever we want. And that's gonna come up really important later today. We'll use the is empty method on the array list and return whatever that is. To enqueue an item, we add the item at position zero. Uh, speaking of which, remember that we have, if I have, let's say, array list, uh, I can say the list.add of blah, and I can also say the list.add of five. So I can give a position. If I don't say anything, it gets added to the last item. If I give a position, then it'll be added at that position and everything else gets pushed to the right. Question, just to, to remind everybody about their Java. What is it called when I have two different, uh, two, excuse me, methods with the same name, but different number and type of parameters? There's, there's a word for what that is. It begins with the letter O. Overloading, correct. So, so add is an overloaded method. Guess I should put that into my notes here. So. Okay, back to cues. Um, doesn't matter. <laughs> we, we, so we're using the overloaded version of add so we can add things at position zero. And then we're going to remove the item at the head of the queue and return it. Uh, but if you're trying to dequeue something from an empty queue, then we'll go, give you a no such element exception. And this is going to be the message that you get when the program blows out. Otherwise, if it's not empty, we remove from the array list the last item. And then peak is exactly the same, only different. Uh, we're using a get here because get will access the value without re returning it. Or I would say something without removing it. It'll it better return it, otherwise what's the point? 
And then again, our size of the queue will reflect the size of the array list. And then the question is, okay, how do I convert it to a string? And I'm adding the words tail and head. Otherwise, when it's empty, I'll return an empty queue. And I guess it might be useful to So let's do a queue demo, and this will be um, demonstrate some of the methods of the queue. That's not much of a case. Okay, so, so the question is, well, how are we? That's the purpose of this. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say. Let's make a queue of string and let's call it states is going to be a new queue of string. You can repeat the type if you want to, you don't have to. And now I'm going to say states. Well, first of all, let's do this. Let's check to see that it actually does the right thing. Let's compile this first. And let's run it. Okay, cool. <laughs> An empty queue really is empty. That, that's nice to know. So now let's say states dot in queue, California, states dot in queue, uh, oh, I don't know, Nevada, and states dot in queue of Now let's take a look at what we get after we add these three things. And so California came in first, so it's at the head. Nevada came behind it, and Illinois is taking up the last position. Now we can say string my state becomes uh, states.dq. And then we can print out the result. After dequeuing uh, my state, <laughs> there's a Python taking over there. Uh, and yeah, this line is just a little bit too long. I keep seeing a lot of that, by the way, of people having gigantically long lines, which means everybody has a really good monitor that can display like 130 characters across. But when I look at the programs, I don't want to have to scroll left and right. So, okay, let's see what happens after we DQ this. And there we are. Now, the question is what happens if I wanted to empty the queue out completely? No matter how big it is, what would I do? How would how could I do that? This is an interesting little problem. I want to. It's going to need a loop, correct? Is everybody completely confused about what I want to do? Yes. Let's say the. What's another way of saying empty the queue? Let's put it this way. As long as there is something in the queue, dequeue it and print it out. Okay, does that help? Okay, so what kind of a loop are we going to need? We're definitely going to need a while loop. And we're going to have to have some condition here. And so what are we going to do? We're going to say string. Um, geez, I don't know the the state, let's call it, is going to be states.dqe. Okay. So what is this condition going to be? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so is not empty. So we have an is empty, right? How do I say I want it to be not empty? Does anybody remember what the operator is for doing the uh, uh, not x? Pardon? Mm -hmm. Exclamation point. <laughs> so as long as the states is not empty, I'm going to dequeue it and then do this. And let's just add a few more uh, things here. Okay. So I'll have five and then I'll DQ California because that was the first thing that came in. And then I'll um, DQ all of the rest. Oh, well, that's interesting. Oh. By the way, if you catch me making a mistake like this, point it out right away. Okay. Remember, is empty belong is is an instance method, and I need to give it an instance of a queue. Otherwise, it otherwise it won't work. And so it, I dequeued California, and then Nevada, yes. Illinois, Delaware, New Jersey. So the it's in exactly the same order as which they entered. Unlike a stack, which is the reverse order, and a queue, it's the same order. And just for the heck of it, let's do this. Let's do system dot out dot. Uh, let's. Uh, let's check to see that it gives us an error. There's no use even printing it out. And sure enough, there we got our message. Q is empty because we tried to DQ an empty Q. And I'll comment that out. So I, I like to leave a program in a working condition. But um, again, I'm going to upload all this when we're done. And um, then we can, you, you can look at it and play with it. Is everybody okay with the idea of how the queue is working? Do you need me to show the output of this again? Would that help? Okay, let me go and run it again. Let's move this here. Oh, I forgot. I forgot to hold on. Let me, let, let me get rid of the, the um, compile error. Or the execution error. There we go. So there's the code on the left and on the right. You can see the result. Again, things enter the queue at the tail, and they leave the queue at the head. Okay. Now the question is, well, what can we use these for? Okay, I mean, it's a, that's interesting. We know we can use stacks for something useful. We can use it for anything that needs to be remembered and reversed, like the history of changes that you've made to uh, an image in that one program. Or if you wanted to say, what's your history in the browser? So that when I'm here in the browser, and pull this out. Oh, well, <laughs> let's go to this Here's a list of all the stuff that I've been, I've I've visited. And again, the stack is perfect for that. Okay, we also use queues when we want to do a simulation. And this is going to be an introduction to the kind of thing you're going to be doing on the group project. And in fact, let's look at the book here real quick. I'm going to skip over this page here. 
Okay, where they have a simulation of a kid's game where you pass something along and whoever ends up with it leaves the game and you keep passing it around until everybody's gone except one person. Which is a, It's a fun little simulation. But what I want to do is I want to do something similar to this simulation of a printing task. And, and what they do, I'm, I'm going to go over this. Yeah, should, should I go over this quickly? I think it would be a good idea, yeah. So here what we have is we have... Um, a bunch of computers, and they have one printer in the computer lab. So what's going to happen is every time somebody at the computer, one of these computers wants to print something, they're going to have to get in line waiting for the printer to become available. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to have multiple tasks sitting here waiting for a printer to become available to us. And that's called a print queue. Um, this is a very, very big thing in computer science okay almost all operating systems use queues to keep track of tasks that have to be done when you have a limited resource that can handle only one thing at a time you want to make sure that people get to it in in order that they came in and now with the question is well how do we model this situation so we have to make some presumptions. We say, well, first of all, the printing is going to be from one to 20 pages in length, and it's going to be sort of random. Yeah. How many people, some people are going to print only one page. Some people may print 20. Some people may print eight pages. You never know. So that's going to be a random variable. So every time somebody enters the queue, they're going to say how many pages they want to print. Then the question is, okay, how often are people going to enter the queue? So let's say there are 20 print tasks per hour on the average. And that means there's going to be one task every 180 seconds. So every second that goes by will generate a random number between 1 and 180. And if it comes out to 180, that means, okay, that was the 1 in 180 chance. And so we're going to generate a new task. And it'll randomly happen. Now, sometimes we'll have 180 seconds go by and nobody enters because we never generated that number. But if we're going for a simulation for three or four hours, we're eventually going to get some tasks entering our queue. We're going to have a print of a queue of print tasks. And what we're going to do for each task, we're going to give a timestamp. So every time it arrives, and we're going to we're, what we're going to do is we're going to have a counter that, ha, uh, that counts how many times the our internal clock has ticked. So we're going to have a little, excuse me, Gesundheit. We're going to have an integer that's going to keep track of how many seconds have passed. And when a new queue enters the task, we're going to say, okay, what does this counter say? And that's going to be how many seconds have elapsed since the beginning of our simulation. So every second that goes by, we're going to ask, did we have a new task? That's our random number between 1 and 180. If so, we're going to add it to the queue, and it's going to say, this is when it entered. And, uh, if the printer is not busy and there is a task, because the, there might not be anybody in the queue, so the printer is not busy, it's just idles. We're going to remove the next task from the print queue and assign it to the printer. And then we're going to uh, subtract the timestamp from the current second to compute how long have we want to know how long people are waiting in the queue but that's the part i didn't say okay what we want to be able to find out is statistics like for example how long is the printer in use we also want to say is okay how long are people waiting in line okay that's very useful to know then we might need to get a faster printer or we might need to restrict the number of pages so that people can't print as many pages and that will speed up the queue significantly but we don't know until we do the simulation. Uh, then we append the waiting time to the task for a list for later processing. And then based on the number of pages, we figure out how much time will be required. Then we say, okay, now the printer is gonna print for one second. And we're gonna subtract one second from the time required for the task. And finally, if that task has been completed, then the printer is not busy anymore and it can handle the next thing in the queue if there is one. And then we can compute how long everything's been waiting on the average. 
And what they're going to have is they're going to have the task, which is the job that people want to print, and the printer. And then we're going to have a queue of tasks called the print queue. And we can put all the classes in the same file. And that'll be print simulation. And then we know how to do random numbers. And we're also going to need the list of waiting times. That's going to be just an ordinary old array. Yeah. Um, and the code is here. And you can look at that. But what I want to do is I want to develop something similar to that. So here's, the, here's what I want to work on today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up until lab time. And then at lab time, I may have to spill over into, to, I'd like to complete that today, but I'm not sure I can do it in 20 minutes. So either I can do it on Wednesday or I can spill over into lab time, take some of that and get it more complete and get it at least started. And then during lab time, because how many of y'all still have to do the stacks assignment? Are still working on it? Okay, you all can work on that then. So well, here's the, the simulation that we're going to do. Um, in a clothing store, we have one line of people waiting to go into a fitting room. And here's the difference. Instead of just having one printer, we have multiple fitting rooms. Now, the question is, what, is the, what do things look like in a clothing store in terms of what things are we going to have to simulate? Well, first thing we need to do is how many people are coming in per hour to try on clothes? Okay, we're going to need the fitting rooms. Oh, I guess, you know, it would be even before that. Before that, it would be really nice to know how many fitting rooms do we have? And now this is how many people are coming in per hour. So what's a good number for this? I, I, we don't have to be, we can make stuff up. Has anybody ever worked in a clothing store that would know, know this sort of stuff? Unfortunately, I did not think of this example until yesterday. If I had thought of it three days ago, I would have gone to a store and just watched for about 15 minutes and just counted. But So how many people do you think would come in for per hour? Well, what's a good number? 12. Okay, so we'll, for, for the purposes of this simulation, we're going to have, where's my cursor here? Okay. Another thing we're going to need to know is how many items do people bring in to try on? Okay, and I have literally no idea, okay, because I've never brought in more than two items. And everybody's just saying, "What? You only two? Okay, <laughs> can somebody somebody give me some give me some numbers so that we can get some estimates?" The limit is always six. Okay, probably because they they, they don't want people to, they don't want the clothes walking away. Okay, <laughs> um, so should we should we get a limit of six? Evenly distributed. That makes our life a lot easier because uh, sometimes there's going to be more people with four, five, and six items than there are with people with one, two, and three items. Okay. And we could make that into our simulation, but let's have it evenly distributed because that's just one other detail that I don't want to have to think about. Now, the question is, how long does it take people to try on each item? plus the setup time and all right, you know, just yeah, you know, making sure that everything's out of my pockets and all that kind of garbage. And the uh, um yeah you, you're ready to Well, we're, we're good. Those are separate things. But how, about how long does it take each person to try on an item? Again, I have literally no idea. So anybody can just give me some estimates from their own experience. Three minutes per item. 
Okay, um, how about between one to three minutes? Okay, and that's going to be randomly distributed in intervals of, let's say, one half minute. That sound about right? Pardon? What do you mean? What do you mean by interval? Oh, that means instead of, instead of just having one minute or two minutes or three minutes, they can take one, one and a half, two, two and a half, th and three. Okay, so we can give them to, they don't have to take an, a complete minute, they can they take a half minute. Like if somebody can try on a, per item is going to be one, one and a half minutes. Okay. And then we also need to know is the average setup and, um, <laughs> tear down is not the word I want to use here. Uh, set up and um, so how long does it take? I'm going to say, let's say one minute to set up. And that's the, uh, from the moment you get in there until you're ready to start trying on the first item. And one minute to um, get ready to leave the room. That sound about right? And we'll just make it one minute for everybody rather than making it some random number. Okay, I think, that there, is there anything else I have forgotten here in terms of what we need to do? We want to, notice by the way, I'm doing all this planning before I even start writing a single line of code. I do not want to write the whole program and then make these decisions afterwards. That's just totally backwards. Yeah, I have to figure out, okay, wh what is the scenario I am trying to simulate? And then I can start writing it. So now the question is, what objects will I need? Yeah. Well, I'll definitely need a customer, right? Okay. And I'll need a queue of customers because the customers are standing in line. The fitting rooms are not standing in line anywhere. They're just there. Then I'm going to need a fitting room class. And I'm going to need to have a certain number of them. And now do I need, are they going to be a, just a plain old array list, a stack, or another queue? Again, this is a design decision. Yeah, I, th I think this is, they're just an array list. So you've got fitting rooms number one, two, three, four, five, six, or because we're computer scientists, fitting room numbers zero through five. Fitting room. And we're going to need a array list of. I, this is this is the not exciting part of writing a program, but we really need to make all these decisions first. Now, what does a customer need to have? Okay, do we need to know their name and their age? No, we don't need to know any of that crap because that doesn't, who cares? Okay, what we need to know is what, what's the most important thing we need to know about the customers? Exactly. So the number of items, which is an integer, I'm doing a sort of a UML diagram here on the fly, but that's okay. Oh, God, I hate autocomplete. There we go. Um, and what else do we need to know? Pardon? How long it takes them to, to try on each item? Okay, yeah, I guess that would be belonging to the customer. Sure, that would be okay. Time per item, which is also going to be an integer. No, no, no. Is it, is it going to be an integer or a float? So that, what we could do is just multiply it by four to get our, or to multiply by two to get our half minutes. Okay, so let's make an, an integer measured in half minutes. Okay. Great. Now, what do we need to know? We, we also need to know is 
definitely the timestamp. Because again, one of the things we want to, oh, that's what we forgot to design here, by the way. What are we measuring anyway? That would be nice to know, wouldn't it? Because that's going to affect all of our other choices. Well, one thing we definitely want to measure is the average time spent in the queue. And, um, do we want to figure out the average amount of time that each fitting room is in use or not? And um, I don't think there's anything else we need to know. If you see, you can think of something else, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Now, the question is, what does a fitting room have to have? Well, it has to have a customer in it, doesn't it? Okay, we have a customer that is in a fitting room and if it's null, if empty, I don't like using null as a flag. We could have a Boolean saying is empty or am, am, is, do we want a, a Boolean flag to check if it's empty or look for the fact that there's a customer object in there? Well, how would you like to do that? Hmm? I like the Boolean more, yeah. So in fact, let's call it. So, Let's call it client. We have a customer type. We'll have a available. Did I spell that right? Yes, which is a boolean. And what else do we need to be able to? We're going to need methods on on this as well. Um. Okay, who is responsible? Oh God, who owns the zebra? Um, who is responsible for doing the? saying whether there's time left. We're gonna need a start time. And then we're also gonna need an end time. Yes? Now, one of the methods that we're going to have to do here when we have an end time and a start time, we also need to be able to look at the current time. So we're going to have it. Okay, these are going to be in seconds, not in minutes. Because why, why, why? I could make them in half minutes so that it matches our um, our timing here. But I just want to do it in seconds. This just this just seems to be a better idea. All of these are design decisions that I've made. Now, some of them may turn out to be really good design decisions. Some of them may be really crappy ones. I, I have not written this before. I'm writing this right now on the fly, to be quite, I'll tell you right now. So I have no idea how this is going to work out in the long run, but at least I have a plan. It's better than going into this with no plan at all. Okay. Why don't we start off with our customer class? Okay, so let's open up our template file. And And this is going to be a
Okay. So here's our class customer. And we're going to have, I guess we can. And then we're going to need a constructor for it. And we're going to have here uh, I don't believe we need any more methods on this one. I can't think of any methods the customer needs. Yeah, we do need one, actually. Um, you know what? This would be really nice if it were public. So we have a customer with percent sign D items, uh, percent sign dot one F minutes per item entered at time percent D. And I've got to divide by 2.0 because otherwise I'd have integer division, which is not what I want. Because these are half minutes, so that will give me the actual minutes. And then I have this dot timestamp. But I don't want to do system.out.printf. I want to return string.format. Okay, because I'm returning a string. Pardon? Pardon? Which one? Are we, what, what line number? Let's just compile that. Okay, that's great. Now, uh, hmm. okay, the way I did this, by the way, um, in the, the way that they do it in the, the printing, is they do something, um, they create a fitting simulation object and then call methods on that. Let's just test, let's put something in here just to test things out, okay? Customer C is new customer. Uh, let's say I have five items. The time per item is going to be three half minutes. And the timestamp is going to be zero. Okay, that looks good. Now what I have is a it can't be public. And once I have this class available, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna wait 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 for the my main method. I haven't I haven't I haven't figured it out quite yet. I notice I didn't do the design on the the main method, so I may have to come back to my design document and do that. In the meantime, what I can do is I can at least grab this here. Uh, pop it back in here.
So let's see, we have um, private customer client, private Boolean available, um, private integer, start time, and private in end time. And then we're going to need a uh, constructor. Yes. So we're going to need um, public hitting room, which is going to have a, if we do it, I think I'm going to use one for an, an empty room. And I'm also going to need one for a one that has data in it. So for an empty room, we have the client is null. Available is true. And start time, start time is zero. Now, this is going to be interesting. When I have a client come in, they already have the number of items, correct? And we also have the timestamp. So I know the start time. I don't have to provide a timestamp, do I? I don't have to provide a, a start time because the, uh, yeah, the, the, the client tells me when they entered the queue. Oh, no, no, no. I do need to know that. Okay. Very important point here. Very important point here. I'm going to write this as a note to myself. There are two different times going on here. One is the client's timestamp. Namely, when they entered the queue versus the fitting room start time, which is when the um, client got into the room in the first place. <laughs> Those are really different. And I almost put them together as the same object. That, that would definitely not work. Yeah. Okay. The difference is... Let's say that we have a, a um, yep. let's say we have Joe, Nancy, and uh, Fred are in here. Well, I'm going to need to go to a separate page here to make this work. So let's say Fred entered at um, 10, 10, 10, 10 o'clock and Nancy. Uh, at 10.05, and Joe is in at 10.06, okay? These are their timestamps. Right. Now, let's say we have a fitting room here, and there's, a, in, the, in our first fitting room, in the room A, is occupied. And let's just have two two fitting rooms for right now, so that I can make this hit. And it and and let's say they're both occupied by somebody. Okay. So now, when Fred Fred started at ten o'clock, but notice it's it's past ten o six, isn't it? Because Joe is here. So when Fred goes into dressing room A. Let's say there's this. So A and B are both occupied. Let's grab this here. Copy and paste it. Now Fred is going to be in here in, in dressing room A because it became available. But notice that even though he came in, it is now 10.09. Okay, because this is when he entered the queue. He came into the store at 10 o'clock to wait for a dressing room, but he wasn't able to get one until 10.09. That means he's been waiting for nine minutes. And that's his start time in the dressing room. This is Fred's. And then we might have a 10... Yeah, you know, thirteen is when Fred will be done trying on his items. 
So this timestamp here is definitely not the same as the time that they entered the dressing room. Now, this may seem silly to you that I'm having to go through and talk and say all this stuff. It, it's, it's so somebody said, well, yeah, of course. No, this is not, of course. And I am not trying to convince you folks that this is correct. I am trying to convince myself that this is the right approach. Because I have to have this straight in my mind if I'm going to be programming it. So thank you for asking that question because that cleared it up for me. Now I know exactly why these two things are different. But I had to talk it through. And sometimes you just have to just talk it through with, and it doesn't have to be somebody who knows the assignment, by the way. You can just find some relative or friend. And just if you're stuck on something, you explain it to them, what you're trying to do. And as you're explaining it, it will all come into place for you. It's amazing how that works. So those are two very different times. Yes. So we need to know um, in our fitting room, we need to know the client and we're also going to need their start time. And so this is going to be a... Uh, well, definitely we're gonna say this dot available is false. Stop. Why do I want to create a new fitting room? I don't want to create a fitting room with a client in it. That doesn't make any damn sense at all. Okay. What I need to do is I need to put someone in the fitting room and I want them to get out of the fitting room. Yes. Okay. So I, <laughs> boy, yeah, yeah. this is part of the design process. You look and say, wait a minute, why am I creating a brand new fitting room? That That doesn't make any damn sense at all. So what we got to go back here and get you know, our design document. What we're going to have is we're going to have to say, enter and give it a customer and exit to get rid of a customer. There we go. Okay. This now this makes more sense. That's the that's the way fitting rooms actually work. When we get a new customer, we don't build a new fitting room. That's that's just weird. We should say, hey. Go in room number five. <laughs> so we're going to have a public void enter and we're going to have a customer enter. And then we're going to have um, this dot client becomes our customer. Now the room is no longer available. And we're also going to have to customer client. And we're also going to have to have an integer entry time. The fitting room is no longer available, and this dot start time becomes our entry time. Now, what's our end time? Okay. Well, we know that it's going to be two minutes. Okay. Time as two minutes. Start up. Finish. Plus um, random number from one to three times the number of items. Okay. Oh, I guess that means I'm going to need to have uh, import java.util.array list. I'm going to need that at some point and java.util.random. Okay. Do I want to put the random number generator here as part of the fitting room? Or create a new one on the fly? Okay, that's a minor point. I'll just create one on the fly. What the hell? And then what we're going to do is this dot end time becomes entry time plus two plus um, plus okay we have a random number it's 
It's one, two, or three, correct? But we have to multiply by two, so it's from one to six. Yes? So that means we're generating random five plus uh, one. But we're measuring everything in seconds, aren't we? Agreed? And we're going to have to multiply that by 60 to get a number of seconds for the start time and the end time. And then we're going to divide it by two. Why are we dividing by two? Because we have the half minutes. And that allows us to figure out if a customer has entered or left, yes? Okay, a customer has entered. That's what we have to do when a customer comes in. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that would be that would be a good idea. And then public void exit. Exit doesn't need any information. We just need to set this is available to be true. Yeah, there's going to be all that other information left around, but the next time we have another customer enter, it's going to overwrite all that other stuff. Okay. And let's compile this just to see that it compiles okay. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Try client. You cannot assign a class to a variable. There we go. Okay. Let's stop here for a moment. Let's take a 10-minute break. Okay. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah, you're seeing me working without a net here, by the way. I'm I'm just I'm just writing this on the fly. Okay. So all these little errors, all these little things that I come up with and say, oh, I forgot about this. I go back, write down my decisions, and then I come back and implement them. So well, well I don't know if you all go through this process yourselves while you're writing it, writing your your assignments. But that, that's the way it, it, it works. You would, Normally in a corporation, by the way, you have a much better design document than this. Okay, it would be much, it would have all the specifics. All of that would have already been planned out. So welcome to Improv Day. And I still haven't done this tick business here, have I? Well, we'll worry about that later. Okay, so 10 minute break. While I think about... Is this really what I need? I think after the break, I'm going to do a little bit more design. And I might... Uh... I don't think I'm going to be able to write this all during lab. So you know, after the break, I'm going to be doing more design work and figure out what the hell. The, the main method is, is, is just baffling me right now. I've got this half-formed idea in my head of what it needs to look like. And by the way, what I'm doing here might not look anything like what the book did with the printing simulation. Okay, let's take that right now. Their design and my design are two totally different things. If the idea is the same, but I'm just approaching it maybe in a totally weird manner. Okay. Meanwhile, let me pause the recording. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do another 10 minutes of this design stuff here. Um, and then and a little bit of the code. So we were talking during the, the break about, okay, we need to figure out how long a fitting room has been in use. So that means each fitting room is going to need a total time. So that means here we're going to have to have a total time which is an integer and we also we have the start time and the end time but we want to know what the current time is 
Yeah, so that's independent of the start time. That way, in, we will have the start time and the end time. Well, we want to preserve them. It's just a good idea to do that. Couldn't you make that static? There's only one period. Um, could I make that static? I might be able to, but I'm, I I want to make it an instance variable. The, the question was, could I make it, because it's being recorded, could I make this a static variable? Because all fitting rooms have the same current time. I'm not sure. They're, they're, but it, it's it's relative to start time. Okay, so is is so this is actually so it's relative to start time, but it can change every time the clock ticks. Okay, that's why that's I it doesn't feel right to be static. So static is over highly overrated. Okay, all right. So that means we're going to have to do some stuff here in our code. We have our total time. So we can check it against the end time to figure out whether we're kicking the customer out or not. And then we're gonna have a private int total time, total time the fitting room is in use. So when we create a new fitting, uh, fitting room, then definitely the end, uh, the total time is gonna be zero. And we may as well set the current time to zero also. Can't hurt. So now when somebody enters, that's also the current time. We're going to set the current time to our entry time. Yeah. Now, since we know what the end time is, we could do the total time right here. Total time plus and becomes this dot end time minus this dot start time. Because we know that's how long that's going to be before they finish up doing their thing. Now we need the tick method. And what that's going to do is it's going to say this dot current time plus plus. And, and then if, how about spelling it correctly? If the current time is equal to the end time, then we call exit. We kick the customer out of the fitting room when their time has expired. When they because we're, we're they're they're through doing their their stuff. Uh, do I want a um, two string? Yeah, you better believe I want a two string because I, I might need to do, do a lot of debugging here. So we have public um, string to string. And we're going to say return string.format. OK, let's see. What are the things that we need to know? We don't really need to know. The, the... That's going to be a true or false value. Uh, Let me check to make sure that's correct. I think that's how you do it. 
So I need to go into J shell. This is one of the, again, this is this is what I'm going to be doing when I'm doing ordinary programming. I'm doing this actually as though I were writing the program for the first time, which I am. Let's have a Boolean variable called um, yes, no, and let's set it to true. And then let's do Boolean dot two string of yes, no. Yes. Okay, I knew that. Yeah, yeah. My intuition was correct. I would have looked it up also. I could have looked it up, but just as easy to try it out and see what happens. So I'm going to look at this. This dot start time. This dot end time. And this dot current time. Let's compile. Let's make sure. Okay, good. And, uh, and now what we're going to need to do here is figure out what our main method is going to do. Okay. So the main method is going to call the simulate method, which takes these parameters. First parameter is going to be the number of fitting rooms we want. And this could be, by the way, a plain old array. It doesn't really need to be an array list because we know the number in advance. Okay. So whatever I put down here for an array list, did I say it was going to be an array list? No, I didn't. Okay. I did say it. This is the kind of thing that I do when I'm taking my notes. The number of fitting rooms we want, and we want the um, number of seconds to run the simulation. And then we want the number of customers per hour. Okay. So here I'm going to have a void simulate. And it's going to be in n rooms. Um, I just wrote it down. I forgot it. Okay. Typical of me. Number of seconds. And um, int. That way we can run simulations with, with different numbers without having to, you know, I, I'm compartmentalizing it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have an array of fitting rooms. And it's going to be um, new fitting room of N rooms. And then we're going to have int the current second is zero. Well, we, can, we can run it as a for loop. It'll be easier as a for loop. Now, the question is when we're going to have our arrival time. Remember, the arrival time is going to be the number of uh, seconds in an hour divided by. So that means integer um, has a magic arrival number is going to be 3,600 divided by the customers per hour. And we're also going to need a random number to tell us whether we were randomly generating. So random generator is a new random. Tell you what, let's just do right now just for for debugging purposes. Oh, we need a name for this array, don't we? I was wondering why, why why that looked wrong. Okay, I plus plus. Let's do system out dot print line. Uh, room plus i plus colon plus our uh, room sub i. Now to do this, what we're going to need to do here. I guess I don't need my in. I'll keep the scanner here. It couldn't hurt. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say uh, fitting simulation, the simulation, 
is going to be a new fitting. So I'm going to make an instance of this application. And then I'm going to say the simulation dot simulate. And we're going to have uh, how many rooms do we have? Six rooms. How many, how many fitting rooms do we want to have in this simulation? Let's have four, four rooms. And uh, we're going to go for two hours, which is going to be 7,200 seconds. And the customers per hour, we said we we're going to have 12. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is exciting. Wow. Okay, that's because these guys here need to be in our main, or don't they? What happened to my main? I, I must have. Uh... Oh, great! Oh. There it is. Okay, we still have this problem here. That's fitting room. This is customer, so that's good. Your class is there. Yeah, the answer is not in any class. It has to be inside a fitting simulation, doesn't it? That makes it. Notice that I, 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 I want to fix my indentation here. If I get my indentation gets screwed up, boy, then every, everything is going to go straight to hell in a handbasket. There, that's much better. And now I can run it. And I haven't created any. Oh, that's that's ugly, isn't it? Okay, this is why I put this debug output in here. Well, that's nice to know. So that means I'm going to have to say room sub i is going to be a new fitting room. Okay, lovely. Everything's working like a champ now. Okay. I'm happy now. Okay. I think everybody's on information overload at this point. That's going to be my timer. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to say for int second is zero, second less than the number of seconds, second plus plus. What I'm going to do is see if I need to generate a customer. Okay. If so, generate them and enqueue them. I still haven't made my queue and queue them. So that means I'm going to definitely need a queue of customer. Clients is going to be a new queue. Right? Then what I have to do is check all the fitting rooms to see if they are finished or not. And then if a fitting room is available and anyone is in the client queue, then I have to dequeue them and put them into a fitting room. So that's what I'm good. That's what the simulation is going to do. Does that does that help? Again, this is that that's my that's my big picture here. I'm not sure quite how I'm going to implement every single bit of this, but at least I've got that idea of what's going on. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording at this point, and I guess I will pick this up um, on Wednesday. The question is whether I should complete the program by then and then just go over it or continue developing it. I'm not sure which to do. What I could do is I could develop the rest of the program at home and record it. Then we'd have a recording of it. 
I'm so indecisive. This is why it takes me so long to design these things because I'm indecisive. Yeah. But the rest of the time, lab time, if you still need to work on the stacks assignment, do that. Otherwise, you may want to go and read the assignment for the group project on cues. And that's going to be, let's go to student view here. The Q project. Yeah. And you may want to, I'm going to say right now the one line for customers with N checkout stations, and you go to the next available station. That's almost exactly what I'm doing here with this example. So, this example might give you a head start on how you might want to implement this in the assignment. So, you can either do that or you can read the book. Now that we've looked over this stuff, you can go and read it and say, oh, now I understand more what the book was saying. Lab time, do it, do what you like. You know where to find me. <laughs>